What's up? How you doing? Uh, so I want to thank Dan Schneider for uh, putting this whole thing together. Thank you very much, Danny and Rivka for organizing everything as well. Uh, you guys are indispensable, especially at this, uh, these trying times. Um, so the sort of the uh, uh, point of this series is to empower uh, everybody out there who you could either, you could be a documentary filmmaker who's done a number of the, uh, documentaries and even series already, or a first time documentary filmmaker or somebody who might have interest in documentary filmmaking. We want to empower you and give you as much information uh, before you start your next project. Um, and whether that's uh, covering development or production, uh, legal, or, or post-production uh, and um, distribution and finance as well. Uh, the, for episode one, which we're doing tonight, is gonna be about developing the documentary. Episode two is gonna be all about production, the nuts and bolts of it, budgeting, uh, equipment, crew, all that fun stuff. And then I think, Stephen, you're gonna talk a little bit more right now about episodes three and four. Sure, episode three is going to focus on legal. And we all know from our documentary work that there are plenty of legal issues to address in connection with documentaries. So we'll discuss clearances and fair use, copyrights, defamation, e and insurance, budgets for clearances, legal. So I'm looking forward to that. And we've got one of the foremost experts will be joining us as our guest on that, Neil Rosini, my partner at FWRV. The fourth section is near and dear to me too, because we all want our work to be seen, so we'll concentrate on distribution and marketing and post-production in the fourth episode, four weeks from now. So, uh, speaking of special guests, uh, it was nice, uh, very nice of uh, Dan to, to suggest one of our advisors, um, and who I already knew, and said, oh my gosh, he's, this guy is, is perfect, because um, Robert Friedman, or Bobby Friedman, presently the CEO of Bungalow Media and Entertainment, has been in our business for 30 years. He is a, um, he's an anchor in the industry, has done so many great things um, from being the president of AOL Interactive Media, uh, is the president of Radical Media and Entertainment, co-chairman of New Line Cinema in charge of worldwide theatrical marketing, and the president of New Line Television, which he launched for the company. Believe it or not, he's, uh, although he looks young, he was an original member of the startup team for MTV. So you can track the uh, evolution of modern media with Bobby, and that's just great for us because we get a chance to um, ask him questions about nonfiction filmmaking, um, whether it's documentaries or documentary series or features, and, um, and there's so much to begin, uh, so much to consider at the very beginning of the process. And this is, um, these are issues that, that over the years, he can readily spot and he understands when you overlook something, it could really turn out to be a fatal flaw. So there are probably uh, a dozen or more key elements to consider, but we always, the most important thing in any documentary is, is the narrative, is the story. So. On a personal level, I'm very interested in, in hearing Bobby's take on what he's looking for when he, when he picks a project. What is it that, um, what's the idea that really gets under his skin and, and what are the factors that um, lead him to commit to an idea? Because there are a million ideas, but can an idea really survive? The scrutiny in the, in the marketplace, and you know, what does it take for for a project to be um, to be something that uh, is appropriate for broadcasters or something for a series versus a feature? So, um, Bob, why don't we start off by by um, discussing the idea? How do you find the idea, and how do you know that it's an idea that can sustain the um, the uh, the, ter the, uh, the term of a documentary, because these things take a, a long time. They're a marathon, and there are many different facets to them. So what do you think about when you, when you select a documentary 
uh, documentary topic, whether it's for a feature or for a series? Well, first of all, I, before I even answer that, I, I thought that Dan was going to say this is the anniversary of something else because it's another day as well, besides oh. the anniversary of Earth Day. However, obviously, he did not study Vassar the way I studied Vassar. Having yeah. said that, um, uh, in addition, uh, aside from just keeping my lawyers close, Steve, uh, which is obviously very important, um, I do want to just say that um, I am just thrilled to be a part of something that is called the Charles Hobson sort of um, vertical, if you will. He was an amazing filmmaker and Inside Bed Stuy, or I forget exactly the title, was really a great doc. And, and, and Belsky and, and, and the Florence Belsky family, I happen coincidentally to be very close uh, with her brother, uh, who was a physician, and, and his wife. So, I, you know, I'm just thrilled to be here. So, you know, a, an idea, it's interesting um, that you ask that. A, an idea really doesn't care who it, whose it is. Um, for us, um, at probably a more organized entertainment company, whether it's here at Bungalow or at Radical or certainly at a place like New Line, um, about... 60% of the ideas we pursue are really internally developed. Um, someone says, you know, I have this passion for something in this space. Um, importantly today, I have access to those assets or those archival uh, assets or those relationships because at the end of the day, um, it doesn't matter how great the idea is um, if you really don't have access to those sorts of things. The other 40% people walk through the door and I remember being scolded all the time by our in-house in attorney at New Line um, because I would take a look at opportunities um, um, that presumably we signed off on that were coming through the door unsolicited. Um, so we, particularly since we're in New York, which I'm, I assume many of you are, um, there are a lot of opportunities that come through the door. People who have great ideas, they just are, have not been in the business of necessarily selling networks, if those ideas are, are to go to networks or others. Um, and they look to us to sort of partner with them. I remember my assistant at New Line, um, when he was my assistant, had, had uh, developed a script that ended up becoming one of our most profitable films. And it goes to show that particularly even today, um, with new media and social media and access to opportunities, there are fewer barriers to entry um, than they were. Um, you know, when I, when I think about those ideas today, to be perfectly honest, um, we really first go and try to find a television partner, whether that's a domestic partner or an international partner. Um, I witness too often, and I'm sure, you know, I've been there myself, where people have a great idea, um, they wait a year and a half to get the funding raised, um, they put it out theatrically, which in and of itself is a difficult feat today, unless it's just for a qualifying festival run um, or academy run. Um, so um, to be perfectly frank, we are very much up to speed on what the networks want. Um, and having said that, um, in addition to the passion projects that we find, um, you know, I'm running a business. Um, and as a result of running a business, I have to sort of develop ideas that would be either acceptable by the buyers, in this case, the networks or the financiers. Um, and today it's changing very rapidly. So my team, my development team that works for me, um, we have calls every single day. Um, we speak to our agents every single day. Our, the agents that we've selected are those that, that we believe can really help develop an idea and help us package it, as opposed to having a relationship with a network, because we think our relationships after this many years are pretty sound. Um, and then we develop um, that idea. Um, and to be perfectly frank, there's no better time, and I say this to every single person who's on the phone, to be in this part of the business. Uh, this documentary business has basically taken over what was the reality business of only a few years ago. Um, though it shares certain qualities, how you actually do these are, um, docs today, whether it's with a network or putting it out as a 90 minute film theatrically, it's very much like what the independent film business was only five years ago. It's just that there's a lot more inventory available at the networks. It used to be that you'd find some crazy loud family and you could tell that story. Um, and that was reality TV. Uh, today, 
we very much still look for a world that's interesting or a character that's interesting, but I'd be lying to you if I'm not more focused on certain genres. We did uh, earlier this year, we produced uh, a film that many of you may have seen called The Panama Papers, a, a, a 90 minute doc with Alex Winter from Ted and uh, Ted's Wild Adventure, who was our director, who's fabulous. Um, we did it for epics. We put it out theatrically and then we distributed it internationally. We just finished uh, the Preppy Murder uh, five part miniseries, um, which for the first time not only aired on um, AMC, but also on Sundance. Um, and, you know, I'm very proud of sort of how we got to that. And I'm happy to, to discuss how we got to that. And right now we're doing the Epstein series um, for a lifetime, a three parter or a four parter, I should say, um, that will appear on Lifetime called Surviving Jeffrey Epstein. And uh, not that dissimilar to what you would see with the R. Kelly doc, though, but the doc is going to feel very different because of the nature uh, of the category. Um, and how you do these today is very different than the way that you did these five years ago, um, working whether network or even theatrically. This is a director's business right now. We have to find the right kinds of directors with the right sensibility for that network uh, or for that distribution. And you really have to think about that network as a brand and what that brand means and what it means to consumers or there won't even be an opportunity to get in the door. Got a question to ask you, it, how often does a network come to you with their idea? in a reverse engineering sort of mode? Well, you know, um, it's a great question. Um, all of the cable networks, and we as a company at Bungalow, I can just give you a two minute bit of propaganda. Um, we do about 70% of what we do is in the unscripted space. On the scripted side, we've done Insatiable on Netflix. We're doing Modern Love on Amazon. Um, we've done some films. Uh, we did 36 hours based on the New York Times franchise on Travel Channel when Travel Channel did travel. Um, but in, in, in our business, in the collective business, and that includes the cable networks, less so the broadcast networks, um, and the platforms, which I would include Apple, Amazon, and Netflix, uh, Hulu, as, as well as some others that are popping up. Uh, Peacock, for example, is a new is a new one. CNN has their own plat platform. Basically, I think of it as a platform, despite the fact it's on CNN. Um, you know, they have their favorite suppliers. And to be perfectly honest, the good news about us has been that we know them. We know the buyers. They're our best friends. This period of time that we're going through right now is almost good because we can call them at home. We don't have to wait a week to get a meeting set up. Um, it used to be that they would come back to their suppliers, even more so now. So the person who did Jersey Shore, you know, Boone and Murray or whomever it may have been, would you go back to Boone and Murray, whomever it may be, and say, or Left Right, or some other production company and say, mm -hmm. um, so I'm thrilled to say that in this doc space right now, we're finding that they're coming back to us a lot, the people that we've worked with. Why? For a bunch of reasons. One, so many of the docs that are being done today are, and I'm going to put quotes around this, a little bit grown up, meaning that not only do they have to be great creatively, not only do you have to have some amazing directors, we have two women directors who are directing the Epstein who had done um, Reversing Row, they had done Preppy for us, uh, they're fabulous, and they have a great voice. But you know, when you do Epstein, or you do a series that's kind of like it, there are a lot of challenges. Um, there are a lot of legal challenges, um, how you produce it and how you corroborate what you're doing so that you don't lose your house um, is key and important. And um, I think for a time like us, where you have a little bit of the maturity in this space for those kind of docs makes sense. But also, you know, listen, this is kind of like the old days of the broadcast networks. In 1981, when we launched MTV, I remember one of my current investors in Bungalow, Jeff Sagansky, was the head of Columbia TriStar and then CBS. And he turned to me and said, mm. I said, Jeff, are you doing these housekeeping deals? He says, a housekeeping deal? I do one deal with a director or with a producer. They have this great thing. I then pay them $2 million and I never see another one. Um, so I think that you have to really, for the right reasons, go back to your suppliers, either because you think that they have good taste or they will kill for you um, or they're easier to work with. So there are a lot of reasons why, but yes, to answer your question, people are coming back um, and particularly with us right now, knock on wood, 
um, we've had a good run. The development process is your foundation to the project house. What are the elements, what are the cornerstones of, of your development process that you need to get in order to set the foundation before you go to a network? What, are, you know, what does that look like? What does the package look like before you go out and shop? Well, first of all, um, you really need a very strong presentation. Um, and that presentation can be anything from a written presentation or a Bible, as some of us call it, or even a script in some cases that sort of outlines um, and gives the episodic beats of your series. Um, in some cases, when you sell it, you need a sizzle reel. And these sizzle reels today, you know, I've done a couple docs. <laughs> I, I laugh, but I remember I had done Spring Broke with Gibney and, and his director um, who had done the Eagles doc we were working. And I said, can you give me that sizzle, that teaser? Um, you know, we did it for Showtime. And I remember her saying, you know, I don't, I, I can't do sizzles I, I, for whatever the reason. Um, so you sit there and you say, okay, I'm going to go to a sizzle maker. And I, and I put that in quotes, um, as opposed <laughs> to someone else, something that can sell it like it, almost like an on-air promo, what we did for 10 years at MTV. Um, but the development process itself is really important. And once you have the idea down and you have it beat out, probably the most important thing is locking up the assets, um, so that you have something that someone else doesn't have. When I walk into a network, I say, I've got these people either locked up or knowing that they'll succumb to us for interviews. Uh, <laughs> we have this archival or something that comes with the project that, that, that's come to us. Um, I would be lying if I didn't say to you that I backwards know how the budget would have to be developed, because you know. You know what Netflix is spending. You know what A&E is spending. Um, you certainly have a range, and that doesn't mean on something that's as big as an important a story as Epstein or some others that we've done that you might not get a better budget or you might not get breakage for a different kind of a director or whatever the case may be, but you better be buttoned up on, on what that is. Um, and that gets to an important question in terms of talent. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're out there right now with three docs that, that we're out there shopping three doc series and we have some talent and I know this talent is only going to work for one of the networks that we're pitching. And having said that, what do you do? You know, do you do a deal with that talent? Do you not do a deal with that talent? When, you know, you could be at Lifetime or you could be at Netflix and they say, we don't want to work with that person. We don't think that person's right for this. So, and I, I'll get to that a little bit later in terms of how you develop these materials and your relationships with your agents or your attorneys, but it's really, really important. Uh, to make sure that it's right. Because if it doesn't align with their brand, it's not gonna go, it doesn't matter. We're, we're out there shopping something now that is humongous, that is big, it's newsworthy, it will be on the front pages. Um, I can tell you if it goes to Netflix, it better have a current investigation aspect to it, as opposed to a historical aspect at Oxygen or whatever the case may be. Um, so you better know your buyer and you better know exactly what they want. Because if you don't deliver that, things will change over time, particularly if you're working with an executive that's smart. The second thing I'll say to your question, because I think, Dan, it's a great question, which is when you pitch a network, who do you pitch? Well, in my case, since I've been around for so long and I don't dye my hair, I just want to say that because Schneider was like suggesting that. Um, <laughs> that um, Literally, when we pitch a network, I know the taste of every single person there. I'm doing Roswell now at History. When we pitched Roswell, I knew exactly the executive that liked that concept or that piece of paranormal or whatever we wanted. Okay, then that's a quick question I want to ask you regarding taste, because how much, when people work at networks, obviously there are the, the needs mandated by the network because of their audience and their sponsors, et cetera, et cetera, right? So how much of the pitch is... The, be, has to be tailored to the executive because of what their tastes are as compared to what the mandate is. It's a balance, right? Sure. No, it, it's both. And, and I'm going to really say something that I shouldn't, but I would admit to this if, I, if this were my last day, <clears throat> um, that we develop multiple presentations for the same doc or television series sure. that we tweak for the networks that we're pitching. In the same way that we're doing that, 
we study the buyers. And not only just so that we can second guess them, but also to understand who would be the best to develop that project. There's no project we go into a network with, if it's a network delivered project, that we are not passionate about. That's the beauty of having your own company. Um, we can go in, my people can take some risks and, and cracks at things, and you had better figure out that it's gonna be an executive that sees it the way, that he or she sees it the way that you see it. One, just to get it bought, but also two, you're gonna be spending the next nine months with them, and you better be aligned in your vision for that project. That's very, and it's not always the senior person. It may be a more junior person. And, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, the networks right now, if you're a network executive with all the consolidation, and which I'm sure you all know, um, they want these good projects. You know, you're pitching them, but if it's a project that they think that they can get through the room, um, which is their room, um, they want to be attached. I can, can't even tell you how many times I've gotten these side sort of calls saying, oh, Bob, why didn't you bring that one to me? You brought it to so-and-so. I would have loved that project. So it's tough out there. You know, you really have to be smart. You have to be transparent. But at the same time, um, it's not always perfect. It seems like you spend a lot of, Stephen, it seems like you spend a lot of time personal time with the with the various networks to understand their mandates which are which has to be tough because it seems like those mandates change with the wind yeah you know um interestingly all of the agencies and i'm sure people on this call know that um, we had been with caa we'd get their set of mandates from the networks uh, we're now with icm we get their set of mandates as far as they know um, i will tell you i am thrilled to death um, when, when, as I mentioned before, working with a group of agents that are really, really smart, um, not just bullies, which agents can be, we know, and they can work for you in that, that way, um, but that are really, really smart, that can read through what a mandate is. Having said that, it still is great to speak directly to the executives and say, what is it you really need now? Not just the published mandates. And at the same time, um, sort of on the go forward, in the last year, we had three projects, it doesn't matter where, that two of them were docs, one was not, um, where we had developed it. We had a lot of development money up front. We didn't even have to develop it ourselves. We got the money from them. And the development period was so long that the mandate had changed midstream. Um, and we developed it. In one case, we actually, for the series, shot a pilot. And, it, and honestly, it was almost worth it because it was a network that we really didn't work with. And the network said, God, we love what we saw here. We've decided we're not doing this kind of programming right now because we just premiered a series that didn't work after we delivered the pilot. But at least they saw what we could do. That's why time is really, really important. That's the beauty of unscripted. And I do believe that one of the challenges, particularly for independent filmmakers who go out who try to raise funding for their docs, the amount of time it takes to raise funding. You know, right now, there was a Julia Child um, uh, scripted uh, movie that was on, on Netflix. CNN just announced today with a, a young guy at Ron Howard's company runs their doc group that they're doing, you know, one for CNN, unscripted. You know, times change. Um, and I think coming out of Corona, this period that we're living in, I do th also think taste will change. I'm not completely sure where I think we'll end up, but I do think there may be a happier time in terms of some of the stuff that's out there, though crime will always work because it always delivers and it's not going away. But I do think that there are some new genres um, that, that will be surfacing. You know, there are a lot of uh, people who are with us tonight and will be tuning in later on who are working on features. And if you could talk, sort of like talk to, to that for a little bit of like when, when people walk into your office and they have a feature that either they're developing or they've already shot a bunch, do you try to steer them into one direction or another and sort of encourage them like, hey, maybe you should think about doing this or that or think about television instead? You know, the, the, the doc world, except for a few exceptions, um, if, if I were going to release a doc theatrically for whatever reason, and then go to the aftermarket and sell it as an acquisition after we've produced it, the numbers that you get in the sale of an acquisition are far lower. 
um, you know, we did with Showtime on Spring Broke because it was funded by a third party. We did that as an acquisition with Showtime. And, you know, very often people will say to me, what's the difference? Let's just stay with that for a second of mm -hmm. producing it yourself and then selling it. Well, it could be the difference between a million dollars and $75,000 from a network in the U.S. Mm. Um, because I don't know really why. I mean, I, I kind of think I do, which is executives want to tailor that doc, if it's a television doc, to work for their network from scratch. And probably, if I were honest, there's a little bit of a survival instinct. If I'm going to have a job, and this is not to say that they don't give great feedback, because in many cases, we're working with some of the smartest folks in the biz, um, but they don't have a job if it's just an acquisitions job. So it's a little bit of a survival tactic that I'm gonna pay you more. On the other side of it, if they do pay you a certain amount of money, if they pay you a million dollars for your doc to produce it as an original production, they keep all ancillary rights. So a lot of this has to be with what is your strategy? Is your strategy to one, build a library? Um, and strategies change. You know, when I launched this company four years ago, Clearly, I was less concerned about building a library um, for the sale of my company down the road, which I want to do down the road, um, mm -hmm. and more to get some of this stuff going. Um, but in today's world, there, there are unique different opportunities. You need cash flow to hire development executives. So I was fine to take a full buyout. Um, and those full buyouts can vary. You know, if you go to Netflix with a doc today, they're going to tell you, I'm buying the world. I'm not just buying the US. Guess what? Today, Julia Child, Sony Classics bought International. They bought the US. If they really want something, maybe people will buy different territories. That's number one. Number two, if you take the traditional route and put a doc out there, I, I, I don't want you to think I'm simplistic and black and white, but you can't spend more than three quarters of a million dollars on a doc and ever think that you will recoup it as long as I'm going to be around to recoup it. Um, so I would agree are, with that. Sure. There are these other sorts of ways to finance docs. You know, I, we did a doc, um, with, uh, under African skies with Paul Simon and, uh, I sold it to lifetime at the at, to, um, I'm sorry, A&E Indy, um, at the time when Molly, who's now running Apple was there and she paid a very healthy license fee. We then went to Sony music because obviously it was so music driven. We got some other things and then we could share. They got the international rights. Um, alternatively with Panama Papers, we sold Epics just the US because they were sort of going through a change and we actually pre-sold the picture internationally. Um, and then we took some of that international pre-sale and supplemented the license fee that we got from Epics. So there are clearly different ways to do this. Most of the networks that are buying docs today would love some kind of a pedigree run, whether it's festivals or otherwise. Most of these networks are not spending a dollar in terms of paid media. They're just cuming it on their own networks uh, to get people to tune in. They love the idea of doing things with festivals and they love awards. Um, and hopefully, you know, uh -huh. for example, on Preppy, you know, hopefully we'll get an Emmy award for it. We think it was great and special, but um, so there are a lot of different ways to skin this cat. Um, the challenge with the theatrical market today is that it's tough. It's tough if you go with a traditional release. Um, and at the end of the day, um, even though you can sort of do that, if you don't sell it, you know, your investors very often get caught holding the bag, which in some cases is fine because they're doing it for different reasons. Yeah, and there's also the fantasy, I think, right now. I mean, it's a reality, but it's a fantasy to of like now in the last few years, you know, indie docs have been going to Sundance and they've had these record breaking sales that were never ever seen before in the history of documentary. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So like you have the AOC documentary that sold, I think it cost them $30,000 and it's sold to Netflix for $10 million. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that that story gets out to the marketplace and to all the other filmmakers. And so that fantasy kind of kicks in. Where do you think the danger of people falling into the trap of that fantasy when they're making their first documentary? Well, I think, I think the trap is twofold. Um, we're working on a doc right now. The, the, the woman who developed it is amazing. 
she's a great filmmaker. Um, and she came in completely driven that there should be a theatrical 90 minute film, regardless of where it went. And we went through sort of the economics of this kind of film and the demographics. And there is no way in hell if this went to television, that it shouldn't be a four part or a five part series. Um, because one, you could put more on the screen, you know, even, you know, at the four or $500,000 an hour episode level, um, you're gonna get a little more out of it. It's a better economic decision, but also creatively, it's a better decision. But it really does come to that. Um, and we pitch a bunch of stuff and we are very open saying this could work as a 90 minute film. Um, or this could work as a four-parter with an arced storyline. And that's the other thing. Depending on which network you go, um, you really have to decide, is this going to be self-contained stories or is it the arc over time? And very often that will be the lens through which you decide whether it's episodic or whether it's a 90-minute film. But it's hard unless you get RBC or one of these out there you know, a great Michael Moore doc, who's obviously a great documentarian, or Alex has done some. Um, we've done some that, in retrospect, I kind of wish we had put it out um, um, theatrically. Um, but remember, the days I did Hoop Dreams, I say I did it mm -hmm. when it was a new line, it was an acquisition for us. Um, and it was through Fine Line. And these were two great filmmakers. I don't know if, if you remember that doc, but it was amazing. Steve James was one of the directors. And yeah, P Peter Gilbert's the other one. And he, oh. he, uh, he may be joining us at one of these. He's a, a friend. So oh, that's great. They're, they're great filmmakers. Then I did another one with him, Just Married, which was another thing, sort of like 7 Up, 14 Up, whatever sure. in sure. that vein. Um, but th that probably would not have worked um, for television in, in the way that we had done it. But remember, I had $15 million to market that film. The theatrical business right now is a very, very different business, not just because Netflix is taking those rights, just because it is a very different business. And I'm not sure where that business will go down the road outside of big blockbuster films. I think it's also important for all the young filmmakers who are watching this right now is to understand that historically, traditionally documentaries were always, a lot of the funding came from grants, or, you know, if you were working in Canada, came from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, or say in England, the BBC, a lot of other foreign countries that, you know, governments would pay for these documentaries. So I think that there's always, there's been a long tradition in documentary filmmaking that it never was really truly a for-profit, mm -hmm. you know, business. It was more like, I want to make this documentary and I hope I can make a living at it, but anything beyond a living, is just pure gravy. But you know, Dan, you bring up a, a, a really good point, um, which is um, there are ways to skirt the system. Um, mm -hmm. Code pros is one such way, which is you g develop a relationship with the BBC or ITV or an international buyer who funds and takes the international away. You know, it's, it's amazing. When you go to a network executive and you say, I have this great idea, and they say to you, we have to keep the world because that's what my boss says. Um, but you say, oh, sorry, the world's not available. I'm not asking your permission. I'm asking for forgiveness. It's already gone. Do you want this domestically? Amazingly, many of them will say yes. So it is possible that you could fund the production of a doc that way and then get a U.S. distributor to take the doc here. And that's becoming more and more the case where you set up international first and that happens. Um, and um, those markets, it used to be that there was one or two markets. It was the UK and Germany that could fund these. There are probably now five or six of these uh, with these buyers that that could make sense. Even with the studios, if you go into Sony Classics, my nephew actually runs you know, the acquisition area at Sony Classics, you go in and you say, you have an idea for a doc, they'll say, Oh, that's great. I really love this. In the best case, I'd like to see it finished. If I don't see it finished, I just want you to know we're keeping all rights, including television. By the way, do you do that deal? Maybe. Um, and that really depends on the filmmakers, what the filmmaker wants to do. The other part of that, I would say, is, and, and it's today more than ever, people want safety. And I don't mean that because of COVID-19. I mean that because they get, budgets are coming down. 
and they want to work with people that they've worked with. So someone comes into my well, office who's a young director and, um, or a nascent director, has a great idea and has great assets to bring in. Um, and, and he or she says, but I really want to develop this, meaning I want to direct it. And I sit there and there's no way on their own, probably getting it even seen by a network or even an ass, a buyer, you know, a, a first look or someone else who's funding some of these things. Um, that's where it does also help to know who you're in bed with. You know, I'd like to think that we're good partners, that whether it's investors or whether it's the networks would say, if you really think this person can do this, we'll trust you, we'll go with this. Um, but also, more importantly, you have to be creative about how you put the production and development team together. We just did a doc series where um, we needed, we had two, two directors, a showrunner that was supposed to be a showrunner, but he was working on something else, but I loved him. There was no one better in the end than he, and he was working on another series. So we did a non-exclusive deal with him where he was basically the supervising producer. Mm. You can package if you're smart about this. Um, so, and that's what you have to do. So if you walk in and you want to direct because it's your passion project, I get it. And by the way, we have a project now that we're pitching, um, to two buyers where uh, we have co-directors, which is interesting. Um, and, we ah, have and that's what I wanted to talk to you yeah. about too. Sure. Because I think it's important also for a lot of, the, a lot of young filmmakers or first time people who are making their doc for the documentary for the first time is talking about the, that sort of marriage between a director and a producer or, or, a, or a creator and a showrunner. Because that marriage could be wonderful or it could just go blammo. And if you could sort of talk more about that marriage. Listen, you know, at the end of the day, there are passive relationships and there are active relationships. <laughs> um, and if you've been in the business, as long as I have, and, and Dan, I know your reputation, um, you really have to be careful. You don't want someone coming in and you just buy them off. Um, you also don't want com someone coming in where you just put it in your stack of development. You know? And I understand it. You know, I was at a big studio for a long time and we were considered the bad boys and girls at New Line in terms of that we broke all the rules and we did it differently. And you know, we, we, we did a film, you know, we did um, um, Dumb and Dumber for $9 million, six million went to Jim Carrey. You know, we, so we, we did things differently. You know, having said that, you've got to be really straight about what the relationship will be. And there are people who come in, by the way, who say, I'd rather be passive. I just want to be an EP. I want to see this made. I've been unable to get this made. Go ahead and run. And then there are the other situations. And all I can say is you just have to be real. You have to maintain your integrity in terms of that relationship. Um, and if so Bobby, yeah, I know that you've, you've relied on, on great counsel uh, all the way through your career. And um, do you recommend that those uh, less experienced documentary, uh, that less uh, filmmakers, producers, that they, before they embark on a project, that they check in with, with counsel and go through some of the elements with them to make sure that, um, that the project is, is something that, will, will, uh, that can survive the, the legal scrutiny? Yeah, I mean, I think now more than ever, you really need that kind of representation. One is for the deal itself or the idea. Um, it is tough in this day and age to protect an idea, um, but there are ways to do it. And when I pitch something to work or either to a funding partner, you know, they will never sign off and say, you know, we may have something similar to this. That's what they would give you um, as submitting the idea to protect themselves. Um, but if you're not protected with that idea, number one, you're in trouble. Number two, in today's world, um, the idea of personal protection, people are so litigious. Um, and, you know, I have great relationships with our council and, and the firms that we work with. Um, having said that, the only people that can survive at the end of the day, these lawyers, and there's a reason. Um, because on a personal level, you have to be really, really careful. Um, our, you know, it's, I, I look at my budget on Epstein and some of the other things we've done where we've hired First Amendment lawyers, we have litigation 
experts who sort of chime in, in addition to our network lawyers that are there. Um, and, and by the way, when you go into a network or you put it out theatrically, you're indemnifying the network. You know, they may say to you, I need $5 million worth of coverage, or, you know, my one-off uh, deductible is twenty-five dollars or $50,000 per occurrence. Uh, the, the reality is you are indemnifying them. So even how you set up your company to protect your home um, is really, really key. Um, so I, I can't, you know, say that more strongly than not. It's less about what's the extra percent that you're gonna get in, in the negotiation um, with your partner. It's just protection. Um, how about life rights agreements? There are those who uh, feel they don't need them. Uh, maybe the subject is in the public domain and uh, they, they are, and the facts are, are, some of the facts are open and notorious and discernible. Um, what are the, do you, is it your habit to secure life rights agreements and, and, um, and uh, if so, why? Well, let me separate your question into two buckets. One is the concept of fair use. Is it in the public domain? For us, it's really no different than music. I mean, you know, we go and we think something's fair use and we have our attorneys, uh, production attorneys actually review it um, before we do it. And, you know, sometimes we're a hundred percent right. Sometimes we're 90% right. It really depends on what we're doing. Um, the other side of this in terms of life rights is there seems to be more of a move in certain cases at certain networks. Um, for example, you know, places like a lifetime or some others will say, um, I know you're doing this doc, but I'd like life rights because I want a two hour lifetime movie of the week as well. Um, so we think of life rights um, more as a economic opportunity um, and from a legal standpoint, um, and we've been pretty safe in the stuff that we've done. When we did Preppy Murder, remember, that was the Chamber story. Um, HBO on a doc. Um, there had been a feature film with Billy Baldwin. And, you know, for us, the difference in our doc was our creative exploitation of that. We believe that we should be telling something from Jennifer Levin's standpoint and her family standpoint and not making a God out of some fricking asshole who did what he did um, to a woman, albeit in 1989. Um, so for us, you know, this legal stuff and what was in the public domain it was really a creative issue more than anything. Um, and we also had the family locked up. They had never spoken before. So we felt kind of comfortable. So it's not black and white. But yes, if you can get life rights, the vet, there's more value there and the buyer would feel better about it, particularly in today's world. Right, and, and it gives you uh, potential longevity for, Without a uh, doubt. as a bridge to other projects and extensions. Without a doubt. Okay, so we're, we're at that point where uh, if, if, uh, if any of our audience would like to ask Bobby a question. You can see that we weren't kidding when we said he was knowledgeable and experienced. So this is the time where we'll open it up for Bobby. Rifka, do you want to take it from here and, and I will. navigate? I do see that someone wrote, look forward to hearing about the new genres. I'm not sure if that was a question. But Bobby, what's hot? What you know, what are what are you know, what are the mandates looking for, you know, this week? Because I know it, it does change on a seasonal basis and with the pandemic that might have some influence too. Generally speaking, where, where do you think the wave is? Uh, you know, where's, where's the current? Sure. Well, uh, clearly crime has not gone away. Um, there are a multiple of destinations to um, sell crime. There's oxygen, there's lifetime, there's discovery, um, ID, um, there's Netflix, um, um, less so at Apple and less so at um, Amazon. Um, but crime is great. Um, both older stories um, that have a beginning, middle, and an end, um, as well as current investigations going forward, which make it a little bit trickier in, in terms of doing that. Beyond that, um, big, big characters, but told in a different way. This Julia Child's story is a great story. Uh, history, um, we're doing Roswell as a six-parter um, with them. 
Um, and, you know, Roswell has been around obviously since 1947 and it's been, you know, but we brought to it a very different lens at Roswell um, by talking about it through the family. They're launching a block at History that has two hour uh, films as a part of it that they announced with Larry Fishburne um, hosting it. Um, so, you know, it's interesting in this space, um, I think that it's not just new genres, it's new ways of telling other stories um, that will continue. And I think an interesting way to think about it is these worlds and these people that people thought about in reality television, um, but you know now there's no such thing as reality television. Um, now it's all sort of in this kind of long form storytelling. Having said that, for many of you who are self-selecting to find out about the doc world, I can tell you, um, that if you do make a decision to go to television and some of you were independent filmmakers um, who went off, funded a doc and then delivered it, um, except for your investors who really didn't give you many notes, um, you'd better probably look to teaming up with someone that works with networks and can sort of be that middle person, if you will. Um, that first set of notes when you're working with a director who's really done independent films and they say, well, in the ending of the third act, I really don't like the lead into act four. And they're saying, they're saying, are you freaking kidding me? They're not even sharing the questions that they're asking in the interviews, some of the, you know, in, in some cases. So I, I think it's really who you find to work with, um, who will be able to, in two seconds, say to you, this kind of cool, it's something new, it hasn't been done, let's try this, or, it's been done and it's been done unsuccessfully, maybe because it was terrible, but someone won't look at it. Um, and that's just about institutional knowledge. Here's one from Kirk Schroeder. On life rights deals, what are customary business terms for the grantor of life rights? Does the network handle that or are you preemptive in terms before you sell to a network? Well, um, that's a great question. Um, having said that, there's not one answer to it. Um, in the best case, um, it's no different than um, um, uh, other kinds of rights. If you're working with a magazine and you are uh, based on a story that they've done, let's forget life rights for a second. You say, I'd like to get life rights, you know, these rights, and I'm going to put in the budget two and a half percent for these rights of, of the budget. Um, same thing with life rights. Is it what comes with those life rights? Is there a, a treasure trove of archival from the family? We're doing Roswell right now. This family has like the coolest stuff from 1947 that's been handed down. That's basically our series. Um, so it really does depend what you bring to the table. Um, and usually you'll go to the network and they'll say, oh no, those kinds of numbers or we're not paying whatever. And you say, hey, listen, um, we can cover this much in the budget because budgets are budgets and you're gonna cover it from some other line, can you give me X amount? Um, and that's, it usually ends up that way in some of these big life right situations. Um, but it's usually thought of as being outside of the budget. Would you suggest for docu documentary filmmakers to have an agent, would that be helpful for them to package their project and present it to networks? Well, um, it's all, you, listen, I'm a believer that it's worth having an agent, um, not because we probably don't need one to present to networks. Um, we and every company uses their representation very, very differently. Um, if you don't have those relationships with the networks, by all means, um, I would find a really smart agent who has those relationships, um, in part depending on where you live, also, is it New York or is it LA, um, to help you pitch. If you do have those relationships, I still like the idea of having an agent because it doesn't mean you have to be exclusive in using their talent or using their writers. In other words, like there are divisions at ICM that I don't think are as strong as divisions at CAA or divisions at William Morris or Endeavor, whomever it may be. Um, so you have to figure out why you're gonna do it. But clearly, um, if you are representing yourself and you really haven't done business with these folks, it is tough even to see something. That doesn't mean that you couldn't say, you know, I'm doing the OJ doc and I have all the rights and I have the five lawyers who have done it and whatever else, and you can get it through, but it's tough. It really is tough. 
and a lot of things fall in the wayside. By the way, there are a lot of production companies that won't look at unsolicited material. We happen to, um, but there are others that haven't and okay. don't. We have time for one more question. Are most of your projects for the SVOD platforms on work for hire basis where they cash flow production or for a fixed license fee for which you deficit finance production? We don't deficit finance, um, though we may end up raising a fund so I can hold on to certain rights. Because if you go in with half of the budget, you can say, I want to keep X, Y, Z. Um, most of the stuff that we're doing is for a predetermined um, license fee. Um, you know, I grew up in the cable television business. So when someone says to me, God, you know, can you make this for $450,000 an hour? Miraculously, we figure out how to do it. It's called X budgeting. Um, that a lot of people say that doesn't make sense to do this. You really need $600,000 an hour or whatever the case may be. Um, but that comes down to being smart um, and having good production teams. We have great production people that work for us. Um, and we figure out a way to make something work. If, if we can't do it well, we won't. We will pass and let them go to a different supplier. Also, depending on the project, if you walk in the door to see us and you have a project um, you know, we know that the budgets at Discovery ID in general are lower than some other budgets, certainly than a Netflix. Um, but if you say to Discovery ID, hey, if I have this, they'll say, don't bring us everything because don't worry, we can step up. That may be true. But the, 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 the networks like Netflix and the platforms are certainly being more generous at this time in terms of the kinds of budgeting that they can do. They're better financed. They don't have to um, live to a bottom line yet though they will. So certainly these SFOD destinations are good places to be. But you know something, I grew up in the cable business. I am so proud of some of the stuff that I'm seeing. You know, I would put our preppy murder series that we did for AMC up against anything. Now why? There's a network, AMC and Sundance, that does a lot of um, scripted programming. We knew that they wanted something that looked filmic. They knew that if they did it with us, a lot of the people that we work with, DPs and others, they're going to get more for their dollar because we work with those people than you would get if you weren't able to attract those people. Because we work with some of the great people. Um, so it really does depend on where it is. But I think all of these places are doing really great product. I am so proud of the television product that I'm seeing. And there is nothing in my basket of whatever that would think that I would have to develop something theatrically to make it great. We are out of, of time, no more questions, but the good news is that we've kicked off our distance. You can have another glass learning, of wine. Yeah. <laughs> our, our distance learning 2020. Um, our first segment for the documentary best practices just, just launched it. Um, uh, thank you, Bobby, for coming in. And crushing, you covered a lot of ground. Thank and the you. good news is that we have three other uh, segments where we can address some of these issues and uh, hopefully hit some questions then. But um, we really appreciate how um, how generous you were and how you know with your with your insight and the experience, we we really gained a lot of um, a lot of the in, in inside what's going on right now. So um, thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Steve, Dan, Dan and Rivka for doing this. Uh, you made it painless, so thank you. Thank Excellent. you so well, much. And thank you all for being here with us. I will keep track of your questions, so we will keep those and make sure we get to those that we didn't get to this week, next week. And just keep an eye on your email. We will be sending you this video if you want to review before the next class and all of the information for episode two. Thank you thank all you for Bobby. coming. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, host. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, thank you, you so Dan. Much. Thank you, everybody.